1932. A Polish novelist wrote a fictitious book as a novelist, and his thesis was there was a country that was about to be invaded by some Mongol hordes from the east. And the people were frightened and wondering how in the world we can defend off these pagans that are about to attack us. But a psychologist got along with some chemists, and in this fictitious book, they came up with a pill. And this pill had the effect of when anyone would take it, they would not worry and be happy. It was a not worry, be happy pill. And so the people in this land took this pill, and sure enough, they didn't worry, they were happy, and therefore, when the invaders came, when the Mongols came and they took over the land, no bloodshed. <laughs> They'd taken this supernatural pill and they didn't worry and they were happy. But the effect of the pill wore off. And then they awakened and discovered that they were taken over by a state that destroys their freedom, their independence, their liberty, a state that dominated every area of their life, and that if they did not conform, they were canceled, they were obliterated, they were considered a non-person. And therefore, the novelist introduced us to another word, a Persian word, the word kitman. And the people there in that land began to do what they did in Persia. When the Islamic hordes came in, they said, you become a Muslim or you die, and therefore so many of them became Muslims, but they practiced what the author called Kitman. What is that? Is that they pretended to believe in the Muslim doctrine. They went to mosque. They said all the right words, but they didn't really believe. And so they became actors because the pill didn't work. Be happy, don't worry. Now they realize the oppression upon which they were under. And so they pretended to accept all the authoritarian power that was put over them, but they didn't really believe it. What happened to them? They became schizophrenic. They said, well, this is who I really am, but this is what I profess that I am. And therefore, the whole nation ended up with the people who had lost their soul. I invite you to kneel with me. Father, we're here in thy house today to give praise to you to listen to truth that speaks through your word. And Lord, be willing to open up our lives, our hearts, and our minds to that which you would touch, forgive, change, renew, and heal. Lord, we come with all of our ideas, our dreams, our presuppositions. May we become transparent so that your divine, infallible, inerrant truth 
might explode anew into our hearts and our lives and we'll leave this place brand new, refreshed, alive as never before is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Alexander Sozhenitsyn, a Russian dissident, powerful, godly, brilliant Christian man, spoke out, was a writer opposing the Soviet communistic government. And it got to the point that they arrested him and put him in a gulag in Manchuria, and he was there for many, many years until finally they decided to let him go and they exiled him, as the Russians called it, into the Western world. But before Solzhenitsyn left, he had written Gulag Archipelago, which is a hard book to read, but a classic book as far as the struggle in which the world finds itself. Before he left Russia, he left them with one little phrase, it was advice to them, and it's still advice to all of us today. Solzhenitsyn said, don't live by lies, L-I-S. Don't live by lies. Don't become a kitman, we would put it in the words of the novelist. Don't, don't pretend you believe and accept but don't live under the cover of lying, things that are not true. And the truth needs to be told, and there's an accountability that we must give as we question things, and the press and all the powerful establishments of education must stand up and verify what is said is indeed the truth. We're studying 1 Corinthians. We're studying what was going on in the city of Corinth in the first century. And the apostle Paul is writing to this church that he was the founding pastor and he is instructing them how they are to live in a society and a culture that was increasingly pagan and godless. What was the problem in Corinth? The thesis simply stated is this. The church was becoming more like the world instead of the world becoming more like the church. And therefore, the morals, the mores that you find there in the church were not being exported out into Corinth. And Paul here begins diagnosing the problem. You got to have a diagnosis of where you are, right? A medical, a social, a philosophical, a theological diagnosis. What's wrong? And with the diagnosis, you have symptoms. And then also with the diagnosis, you have a cure. And this is what Paul is doing, a diagnosis. It's been some years ago. I think it was General Motors. They put out an automobile in a middle Midwestern town. A man bought a brand new car. But something began to happen that was very strange. And he wrote about it to the CEO of General Motors, and this was his complaint. And by the way, he said he took the complaint to the dealership, and they didn't understand it. He said, almost every night when I get off from work, I go by the same little ice cream shop, and I buy my family some ice cream. And he said, every time I buy vanilla ice cream for my family, I go back to my new car, and it doesn't start. 
But he said, when I buy different kinds of varieties of ice cream, I go back to my car and it starts every time. And so this was a joke and they passed the letter up all the way through the complaint. He got to the CEO and the CEO thought it's hilarious. You buy vanilla, the car doesn't start. You buy other ice creams and the car starts. But an engineer happened to be in the executive room. He said, you know, I know the people in that dealership and they can't figure this out. Let's go see if this guy is really a kook or there's something legitimate here. So he flew to the Midwestern city. He went to the dealership and all the mechanics and the authorities there said, it really happens. I, I've, I've been with him. And so this man came and got with this man and sure enough, after work, they went to the ice cream shop and every time they would buy vanilla, they'd go back, the car wouldn't start. Next day, they would go and they'd buy some fruity kind of mixture of ice cream and went back and the car started. And, and the engineer said, this is wild. And so it went on for about four days. And he wrote back to the company and said, listen, this sounds bizarre, but it happens every time. Buy vanilla, won't start. Buy any other ice cream, it starts. And then he figured it out. Remember where we are? We're doing a diagnosis, right? What's wrong? He figured it out. He said, when you went in by vanilla, there wasn't a line there, and you buy vanilla in, in, in a few minutes. You go back, go back to the car, and the car wouldn't start because of vapor lock. But when he would go and buy a fruity kind of ice cream, there'd be lines there. It'd take 10 minutes or so, and by that time, the car would cool down, and the car would start. You see, a diagnosis. Paul looked at the situation in Corinth and said, I want to give you a diagnosis. And then he begins to tick off the problems that they had. And the major problems that they had dealt with life. L-I-F-E, life. First of all, there was no reverence for life in Corinth. They had child sacrifice, many of their temples. A child pre-born or after the child was born, you could do anything in the world. You could sell them. You could throw them away. You could sell them to some rich people. They'd become a sex slave. That was the mentality, the morality in Corinth in the first century. No reverence for life. Number two, they had no borders. People came from all over the world to Corinth. Read the history. They came from China. They came from Israel. They, they came all over the Middle East. They came, of course, from, from, from Asia. They came from Africa. They all went to Corinth for one reason, to make money. It was strategic seaport, that little isthmus. And it was a thriving city, and they had every kind of religion, every kind of understanding, every kind of mysticism, every kind of witchcraft. They all went to Corinth to make money and some to exercise all the hedonistic pleasures that were available in every form you could imagine. And we'll get to that in the chapters that are coming. You talked about sickness in the whole area of human sexuality. Corinth could match anything we can talk about, but that's coming. Just keep that down right now. So the problem was life. No reverence. Anyone was made in the image of God far into the Corinthians. No borders. Everybody came everywhere to make money and to have pleasure. And then there was another problem there. You say, well, how did they have a government? There were no ballots. The emperor and the Roman Senate, they'd appoint some governor to run with a total power, and you yielded to those who were in autocratic control, and you bowed before their ideology, and you became, in the words of the Polish novelist, Kickman, didn't believe it, but bowed before it. It's not true. 
but we believe we accept it as if it were true. And then Paul goes on and says, this is how Christians are to live. This is how those who are in the church, part of the church, peripheral of the church, claim the church, we are to live. Here is this crucible of God's word, God's truth, God's people. What do you find there in the church? And he tells us exactly as we walk through a little section of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2, verse 14, but the natural person, the natural man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, nor how can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man is the person without Christ. And he says the natural man cannot understand the things of God. William Wilberforce, you need to know who that is. Wilberforce, for 21 years in the House of Commons, presented a bill that would strike down godless slavery in the British Empire. For 21 years, he presented the same bill over and over and over on biblical basis, talking about the godlessness, the evil of slavery. And for 21 years, they voted down that bill. But the 22nd year, he presented the bill, and they, the whole British Empire, made slavery illegal and branded it as godless. That's the kind of born-again man Wilberforce was. His friend was William Pitt, for a time was prime minister of England. Pitt was a member of the church. You know, he, he checked the box. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian, but I had no understanding of what that meant. Wilberforce kept witnessing to the younger man, Pitt, hoping he'd come to believe in Christ. Pitt didn't get it. He didn't follow. But Wilberforce took him to a worship service, and Wilberforce said the service was powerful, the music like we've experienced, the, the, the clear presentation of the Word of God, how people can come to Christ and have a new life. It was so clear that Wilberforce said, surely Pitt, then prime minister, would get it. But at the service, he asked Pitt what he thought about what was said. And Pitt said, you know, I, I didn't know what that fellow was talking about. How can that happen? It's because those who are in Christ begin to understand the value and the permanency of spiritual things. Paul talks about it. Everybody went to Corinth, and a lot of us live today as natural people, and our life is centered around what? Pleasure, possessions, popularity, power. And that's the center of anybody's life. They are a natural person, Paul would say, and away from God and away from Christ, and spiritual things don't excite them at all. They don't get it. And so there are natural people, Paul says, who hang around in the church, have a general belief about God, but nothing personal to realize the revolutionary nature that happens in a life who gives their life to Jesus Christ and stops centering their life around self and selfishness. There's natural people. Then Paul goes on to talk about spiritual people. He said that's another category that you find. Look at verse 15, chapter 2. But he who is spiritually Spiritual judges all things. We have discernment. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. We stand on biblical principles. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. That's what I'm seeking. That's what God's building in us. It sure takes a long time with me. And it may be slow with you. But we, have, we are developing the very mind of Christ. You see, we think we come to Christ, shazam, I'm 100%, I'm pure, clean, I'll never stumble and fall again. No, no, no. We grow 
in spirituality and knowledge. And you see the contrast. Go home and read it. I bet few will. Read it in, in Galatians chapter number three, the contrast between somebody who's natural and somebody who's spiritual. Somebody's spiritual. We're growing up. We don't even know it. It's gradual. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all of it's there. And that's gradually, slowly happening in our lives until we develop a new kind of thinking. Paul says we even have the capacity to have something like the mind and the discernment and the insight of Jesus Christ, spiritual things. And by the way, Paul also had a passage preceding this, said when the end of life comes, bang, last breath, we're tested by fire. Yeah. And he used the figure of fire, and he says, when the fire comes, how's your prosperity working when you're dead? Well, I'm, no, it's not there. How's your popularity? How's your power? All the play, all of that is burned up. Paul says, what remains? The spiritual things, the reality of who you are and who I am. And he said he calls the body wood, hay, and stubble burns up, but he uses gold and silver, precious things remain. That's the spiritual dimension, ladies and gentlemen. And that's who we really are anyway. So he introduces us to two people, and then he introduces us to a third person. And this is the one that scares me. Chapter 3. Paul says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, fleshly people. They're Christians, but they're fleshly, carnal, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're not able, for you are carnal. And divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men, like natural people? You see, we can receive Christ and be a Christian, but still live as if we were not a Christian, right? We'd still have a fleshly existence, sure. And all of us have left back into carnality, every single one. But we begin to live like carnal people, like fleshly people, like worldly people. And he says, therefore, I can't feed you. Paul says, I came there to Corinth, and I told you how to know Christ, how to be saved, how to be salvaged, how to have a new life, to let him run your life. And you responded to that. He said, I fed you baby food. I fed you milk. He said, now I turn around years later, and I see that you're still drinking milk. You're still eating baby food. You haven't grown. You haven't matured. Babies need milk. Milk nourishes them. And they need, when they get a little older, some mashed up food. They don't have teeth. But babies, you know, about a year old, they, a lot of teeth have come in. A year and a half, more teeth have come in. And the time they get two years old, most of the teeth has come in. And therefore, they're ready to eat really good, balanced food. And they need that to grow and develop. They need milk when they're children, they're babies and infants, and now they need more food. And Paul says, I can't give you more food. You're still living a carnal, fleshy life, and you're going to stay a baby your whole life. But now you've got teeth. Grow up. I wonder if we took all of us in here as Christians and God graded us, as to where we are in our spiritual maturity, I think a lot of us would still be in the nursery. In the nursery. Paul is saying, you're missing out on the joy of life. And underneath this, what was all the problems? They were divided. Does that sound familiar? They were dividing the groups. One of them says, you know, we like Peter. He's a Jew. Probably a different color. Others like Paul, he's a Roman. Probably a different color. Others like Apollos, he's Egyptian. And so all of a sudden they're dividing about what they taught and how they looked in light of reality. And Paul says, that's not the church. 
The body of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, we do not divide people up. We read it in Galatians. Paul said, you're not male or female. You're not bond or free. He said that you're not Jew or Gentile. We don't divide up in the body of Christ. Under Christ, we are all one. And all these human divisions, everybody's trying to divide us up in. That dog won't hunt in the body of Christ, the church.